from Redox. Um, I've been there basically the whole time. I was employee number two, which was also developer number two. Um, we help applications and health systems share data. It doesn't matter if it's EHR data, billing data, we just want to make seamless integrations happen faster. Um, in my talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about government regulations that are coming out, up uh, and how they're going to affect APIs and you know, why I think it's the right time to move to the cloud if you're not on the cloud already. And highlight some of the, the Redox customers that are benefiting from us being cloud native. Um, again, somewhat bombastic title, but bear with me. So I always start with the conclusion. Um, the government is, is going to upheave the way data is shared um, starting as soon as next year. There's going to be a lot of new requirements for, for APIs to be stood up by both payers and providers. Um, well, we already have some of that in the wild, but it's going to be much more comprehensive. <coughs> There's a ton of potential for this. Um, you know, I think it doesn't take like a PhD to see that if you have access to data, you can become more informed, um, both as a consumer or a patient. Uh, but there's also a great risk of it blowing up. So I started my career at Epic um, right at the beginning of the stimulus. And a lot of recent reporting has detailed how, you know, this push to get EHRs installed has actually led to some bad outcomes. So I'm going to sort of uh, give you a strategy guide on how to not have it blow up in your face. So the policy part of this um, comes from CMS and ONC. Um, I hope nobody from CMS or ONC is here, but I'm not going to say anything too offensive. <coughs> there is a little you know, implication in this slide, but um, basically, loads of new requirements. Um, the biggest ones are payers need to now have Fire APIs for their members. So if anybody has their Apple like smartphone and have pulled their health records, a similar type thing should happen for your insurer. <clears throat> and then EHRs um, who already should have had APIs um, according to past regulations now need to standardize on fire. And USCDI is kind of like a data standard. So um, having the right codes and the right fields. So the, the joke in the image is like, you know, this is coming from on high. Um, a lot of the smaller payers, you know, don't really even have member portals. Um, the sort of cadres of the EHR developers, and you know, not to pick on Pascal, but um, they're sort of saddled with legacy technology. And then patients, you know, like so still struggle to get paper records. So um, we're we're kind of doing a quantum leap in some cases. So you might ask why. <laughs> um, again, I think I think it's uh, you know. Very well known that healthcare is very expensive in the United States. And the theory is that APIs can do a couple of things. So <clears throat> increase competition, so making it easier to just move between payers or providers, um, making consumers more informed. So you know you can pull your claims and see, you know, I'm not getting a good deal. Um, and the holy grail is really healthier patients, right? So if you have access to your lab results on your smartphone, like theoretically you get healthier because you're looking at your lipids more. So I think there's reason to be skeptical of all of those, but um, it's worth trying, in my opinion. <clears throat> and I mentioned there isn't a great track record of this. Um, if you haven't read this piece yet um, from Kaiser News Network, it is very, very detailed and has a lot of like horrible, horrible stories about patients being harmed by sort of misconfigured EHRs or interfaces that weren't running. Um, and they sort of trace it back to this government stimulus to adopt EHRs. So there, there is, you know, sort of a, a really uh, huge risk for pushing APIs before they're ready. Um, and I'm going to get into that a little bit. It's kind of why I call it Armageddon. <laughs> um, to me, Armageddon comes in two flavors, and these are things I've seen in the wild at Redox. Um, on one hand, you have innovative companies who want to connect with you know, EHRs, want to connect with payers, and get data to do useful things. But there's just so many different implementations out there that they can't go fast. Um, this is sort of Redox's core mission is helping those people scale. So we go out and 
and clean up the differences between data sources and let them integrate once. <coughs> um, the other side of the Armageddon coin here, you know, great soundtrack by the way, um, are firms who would otherwise be doing innovative things, um, say an EHR company, they could be putting money into making their product more usable. Like I think usability is a huge challenge. Um, doctors are burning out at record rates. But rather, instead they're focusing efforts on APIs, right? Um, so either they, they don't focus on the right features or they go out of business. So I wanna talk about number one first, um, these hundreds of differences of silos. Um, part of what uh, the team I used to be on at Redox does is go out and read API specs for our customers, code to those APIs, and then map it back to our standard API. This is a message from Slack um, from this guy, Chris. He's pretty funny. Um, we got a request for an API, and it just had like this totally custom off method, um, which is no problem. We have like a nice framework for, you know, doing the code. It's a pretty quick turnaround, um, but he just kind of like had to rant a little bit. And their 404 page had this little person. If this is your company, I'm, I'm sorry to mock you. Um, I don't actually know who it is, but um, <coughs> there's, this is really the, the status quo. So of the you know, 50, 60 EHRs we've integrated with, um, no two are alike. And there is some stuff in this legislation that like, says we should start to converge on fire, but there's lots of variability you can put into fire still. That number at the bottom is what CMS estimates is gonna be invested in the payer side of standing these things up. And this $400 million is what the ONC side estimates it's gonna cost for EHR vendors to stand this up. So we're talking about almost a billion dollars to be invested in new technology. Um, thankfully this is not like taxpayer directly funded. This is those companies having to make these investments. Um, but it's gonna trickle down to us somehow, right? Either your insurance premiums are gonna go up um, or doctors need to you know, spend more money on their EHR product or license new modules. Um, so yeah, my, my call to arms is like, let's spend this money on a future, like future-proof solution rather than trying to like reuse our legacy infrastructure. <clears throat> I wanted to just highlight a Redox customer who, who's using us to solve this problem right now. So like I mentioned, this is the status quo. Um, Point Click Care is a Canadian company actually, <clears throat> and they're a cloud-based EHR. They're the North American leader in long-term post-acute care settings. Um, you can't really think of a more appropriate type of product that needs integration, right? If you're post-acute, um, you would really want that people caring for you after you leave the hospital to know everything about what happened in the hospital. Um, but they, they, start, they struggle because there's so many different systems out there and there's so many different endpoints and then once you actually find you know, the sort of address of who you need to talk to, um, their data variations can like slow you down. Um, so Point Cut Care builds one connection to us and then we're able to multiplex it out and connect to all the different kind of systems they want to. So whether it's HL7 version two sort of admission notifications or um, sharing CDA documents back and forth, uh, we just kind of run, run with all their integration needs um, and their development team stays really, really lean on their side. So this is like actively making an impact for hundreds of, uh, hundreds of thousands of patients um, and we're gonna keep growing that to the millions and and tens of millions. So part two, um, I think maybe applies to more people in this room. This is just you trying to build an API and falling on your face or um, spending so much money on it, you go out of business. Um, here's another table from the, the regulation. So if you, if you haven't read these new uh, rules, I'm not even talking about data blocking, which is part of it, um, but they go into a lot of details and a lot of research about how they came to their conclusions. And this one really stands out to me. So this is from um, sort of that previous round of regulations. 
and what it did to the number of EHRs on the market. Um, so essentially between these, not, these years are sort of the certification additions, but in sort of a, a five year span, let's say, 20% um, of EHR vendors stopped attesting to the meaningful use program. So either they went out of business or just kind of gave up or pivoted in startup terms. Um, this is like this is definitely going to happen again with with some of these new regulations, um, and yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to read too much into the number. I mean, it could just be really really bad products that fell out, um, but it could have also been, you know, innovative startups who would have had the next great EHR, but they had so much of a regulatory burden they couldn't make it. Um, another helpful mental model for this is this uh, crossing the chasm from the book, Crossing the Chasm. Um, this is actually like a technology adoption curve. I think it was first developed by some rural sociologists to explain farming technology adoption. Um, but in essence, you have this, this sort of uh, early group who can sort of see a little bit of what's coming, and they buy in early. Um, then there's this majority and then there's the laggards. What happened with EHRs and what's, what's happening with these API rules is we're sort of pushing people across the chasm um, before they're ready. The chasm is usually something that startups worry about. So you need to figure out how to get people um, to buy your product so you can get across the chasm, uh, otherwise, otherwise you fail. Um, when it comes to you know, big established companies who don't necessarily have API competencies, um, you, can, you can sort of just like fall into the chasm. Um, it, it becomes very hard to keep up and to sort of reinvent yourself as a cloud company or as an API company. Um, I kind of developed a meme. Uh, you can steal this. I think that when it comes to being API driven, and the, we sort of talk about the API economy a lot, um, there's different tiers. So uh, if you're not familiar with the expanding brain meme, the idea is you kind of go up uh, in sort of understanding until the last one, which is supposed to be a joke. So the first one is just like the government forces you to make an API. Um, I don't know if this has happened in any other industry, uh, but you're really not well equipped to build an API at that point. Second one is, you know, your biggest customer pays you to make an API because they can see some value in it, but you don't necessarily see the value yet. Um, a lot of EHR companies, I think, fall into this bucket. Where they're good at listening to their customers, but not necessarily being innovative. Um, third is when your business model is actually driven by your API. So um, we use PagerDuty quite a bit. Um, they just went public. So, they, you know, you can just have like a phone pager um, or be called by someone and get paged, but the real value is like, you know, having your systems automatically create pages for you. Um, Athena works like this in some, in some respect too. They, you know, make money off of claims. And the more data they get, the better, the cleaner those claims become. Um, but it's, it's a little bit of a stretch. But they were a leader for a long time in sort of the healthcare API space. Um, finally, it's, it's API companies who then build APIs to manage the APIs. Um, I think Redox is like that, and AWS is very much like that, right? You can script everything in your AWS. Um, yeah. So what the cloud gives you is the ability to jump from, say, that like very small brain to one of the bigger brains right away. Um, with, there's a great AWS white paper, I think it's like the white paper number one, um, where they talk about like the characteristics of a horizontally scalable application. So you can just, you know, you might have to re-architect existing code you have, but it makes it so easy to build something that scales horizontally from day one on the cloud. Um, as a developer, I've seen the real power of number two here, where you're not sitting around for months and months and months waiting for a server to be up so you can start coding. 
Um, you just click a couple buttons, and there's your infrastructure, and you start deploying. Um, you know, you might even start to dabble in continuous deployment and DevOps, um, you know, depending on how, how modern you already are. Hopefully most of you are already doing quite a bit in that regard, but um, yeah, then there's tons of off-the-shelf solutions. So, like my colleague was lamenting, you know, this, this EHR company could have just taken something off the shelf and stood it up and it would have been much easier and more predictable to integrate with. AWS just gives you that out of the box. So if you wanna make a no auth server and have users provisioned um, in like Cognito, super, super easy. Um, you, you can focus on hard things. Um, in that case, in this case, you know, it might be um, getting data that's right now in flat files and SFTP'd into your APIs. Um, but don't, you know, don't, don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to some of these things. Um, to highlight another Redox customer uh, who, who sort of is, is solving this problem with Redox, um, this is the Brigham, Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. So they're not really at risk of going out of business, um, but they, they definitely have constrained resources when it comes to integrating products, right? So they would rather spend their time trying out new products and being innovative, building their own new applications instead of like focusing on connecting what's already there. Um, so one cool thing we do with them is sort of um, make this one connection into their their sort of network environment and take their interfaces and then we can reuse those for each new application they want, want to use. Um, to them, an application being connected to Redox means that that application has sort of already been vetted. Like they know that that application can integrate reliably um, and they don't have to sort of vet the integration capabilities of that product. Um, and finally, they their real vision is to sort of you know, take, take like a telemedicine app and then compare it against four other ones, um, which in, in sort of the status quo world, you know, each, each integration in that regard takes six months. So by the time you've evaluated four telemedicine products, um, it's two years have passed and you don't have a telemedicine product. Um, with our model, we can connect that same feed and it's already connected at, at the Brigham um, to those four telemedicine apps in a matter of, you know, weeks or days rather than months. So um, definitely not, not, um, not throwing people and time and money at integration, um, instead letting us do it and focusing on actual innovation. So we have time for questions. I uh, just wanted to kind of reiterate um, this, this new government policy uh, I think is gonna be tremendous in terms of the, the sort of upheaval of our industry. Um, there's a huge potential for positive improvement as well. So it's not just compl a complete waste of time. There's, there's real things we can sort of foresee happening um, that will ultimately lead to cheaper healthcare and healthier patients. But we really need to focus on the scalability and the architecture of the solutions that are built. Um, so we don't end up with the status quo again. Um, and just in case you want to comment on this, um, CMS and ONC have extended the comment deadline to June 3rd. It was May 3rd before. So good timing for, for this conference. Um, many of the things in the CMS role are slated to take effect on January 1st. So um, depending on so what the final role looks like, that might change. And then the ONC stuff has a little bit of a certification Book attached to it as well, so we don't know about that. But thanks everybody for coming out so early. <laughs>